In the restroom of a shopping mall in Abu Dhabi, United Arab Emirates, an American kindergarten teacher who is also a mother of twins was fatally slashed by a robed figure referred to as the Reem Island Ghost. Shortly after U.S. embassies in the Middle East alerted residents about an anonymous message on a jihadist website that encouraged assaults against teachers at American schools in the region, an attack has taken place on a teacher, identified by her family as 47-year-old Ebolia Ryan. According to Ryan's online bio, she was born in Romania, had her teaching training in the U.S., and spent 15 years working in four different countries. She posted on the teacher recruitment website, I wanted to experience the Arab world to learn about their culture and daily life. I work in a fairly traditional community, so getting to know and comprehend their culture is quite intriguing. The U.S. Embassy in Abu Dhabi has verified that an American national died in a public restroom at a mall on Reem Island and has stated that they are coordinating with all relevant authorities. The suspect can be seen entering the mall just after 1 p.m. local time, dressed in a customary black robe, gloves, and a face covering known as a niqab, according to CCTV footage published by Abu Dhabi police. After a brief exchange with a mall security guard, the individual is next seen getting out of an elevator, grabbing a newspaper, and going to the restroom. The footage shows the suspect running out of the bathroom about 90 seconds later, heading straight for the elevator, while onlookers start to disperse. A female bystander evidently attempts, but is unable to halt the suspect as she bolts into the elevator and exits the premises by striding out of the building through the entrance. Images of blood splattered on the bathroom floor and a kitchen knife covered with blood were also shown in the footage. After being taken to Sheikh Khalifa Medical City right after, the injured woman passed away due to her wounds from the attack. An investigation into the reason behind the altercation, as well as the name, gender, and motivation of the suspect, is still in progress, according to a statement from Abu Dhabi police. According to Mr. Rashid Mohammed, head of Abu Dhabi's criminal investigation department, the victim's twins are currently under custody of police. The third child she had was not in Emirates with her. According to Ben Glickman, CEO of Footprints Recruiting, Ryan was content enough in Abu Dhabi that she had discussed finding a new job or extending her teaching contract there. He claimed she was really kind and motivated. I am aware that she was employed in special education before relocating to the UAE. I think she worked one-on-one -on -one in Colorado with a youngster who had Down syndrome. She was a compassionate, sympathetic, and lovely lady. He claimed that other foreign teachers had been disturbed of the crime. But we still need to hear more details from the authorities on the motive. On October 29th, the U.S. Embassy in Abu Dhabi warned U.S. residents about the anonymous post that called for assaults against U.S. teachers. However, the embassy stated that it was not aware of any particular serious threat directed towards any U.S., UAE-based institution or individual. Yet, it pointed out that the mission is reviewing the security posture of nearby schools that have been noticed by the U.S. government. When it comes to their personal safety, U.S. nationals living in or visiting the UAE should exercise caution. Ryan urged others to consider teaching abroad in her footprints recruiting profile. I would advise being optimistic, adaptable, and open-minded, and to view every obstacle as a teaching opportunity, she wrote. Express gratitude for the opportunity to get experience in working overseas. In the end, I believe it teaches you more about yourself than it does about other people. On June 29, 2015, 31 years old Allah Badr al Hashimi, the murderer, was sentenced to death after it was established that she had killed Ebola Ryan by stabbing her to death, along with creating a homemade bomb that was placed in front of the home of an Egyptian-American doctor. A number of spine-tingling true crime documentaries that have kept audiences on the edge of their seats have been produced by Netflix. The Girl in the Pictures, a recent documentary, uncovers the shocking tale of a little girl named Sharon Marshall, who was kidnapped by her stepfather Franklin Delano Floyd when she was just a kid, 
who subsequently married the girl he had raised as a daughter. Later on, her body was discovered by the roadside. September 9, 1969, saw the birth of Sharon Marshall, whose real name was Suzanne Marie Savakis. Suzanne was one of the four children of Sandy Chipman, her mother. She also had a son named Philip and two other daughters, Allison and Amy. Franklin Delano Floyd, who went by numerous aliases, including Brandon Williams, was Chipman's spouse. When Chipman was serving a 30-day prison sentence in 1975 for issuing bogus checks, Floyd kidnapped all of her children and departed. At that time, Sharon would have been five or six years old. Since Floyd was the children's stepfather at the time, police allegedly declined to take any action and allowed him to abduct the kids. Despite this, Chipman continued to search for her kids. Subsequently, she discovered that two of her children had been placed in foster care. However, her sole son, Philip, and daughter, Suzanne, were still absent. Suzanne was seized by Floyd, who renamed her Sharon Marshall so that she would not be identified. For a long while, Philip's whereabouts were a mystery. However, in 2019, the now adult Philip had a DNA test, which proved to be the answer to his true identity, as he had suspicions that he was the missing youngster. Later on, it was learned that Floyd had offered him for adoption. Floyd raised Suzanne as his own child enrolling her in an Oklahoma City public school under the alias Sharon Marshall. According to reports, Sharon excelled academically and was awarded a scholarship to study aerospace engineering at Georgia Tech University. However, Floyd prevented her from following her aspirations after she became pregnant from an affair, forcing her to work as a stripper and exotic dancer under several aliases, including... Tanya Tadlock. Sharon was assaulted by Floyd for many years as she grew older, and at the age of 16, he married the girl he had raised as his daughter. She raised her son Michael when they were living together in the United States. In April 1990, Sharon went shopping for baby supplies for her two-year-old son Michael when she was discovered dead on the side of the road. She was 20 years old at the time, and she suffered a brain bleed in addition to bruising. After being taken to a nearby hospital, she passed away there. Police initially assumed she was the victim of a hit and run, but eventually began to suspect Floyd of Sharon's murder, despite his claim that he was asleep at the time and that they couldn't connect him to the crime. Sharon suffered blunt force injuries to her head that were not consistent with being in a car accident. Later, Floyd abducted Michael, the son of Sharon, from his school at gunpoint. The same day Michael was killed, Floyd admitted to the FBI that he was the one who had shot him in the head. For several decades following her death in 2014, Sharon's identity remained a mystery until nearly 25 years later. Five years after Sharon passed away, a mechanic discovered an envelope with 97 images of Cheryl Ann Comesso, a brutally abused missing lady, in a truck he had bought recently. Sharon's co-worker Cheryl Ann had been hit in the face by Floyd during a heated argument in front of witnesses. Cheryl Ann vanished in 1989, and although her body was discovered in 1995, no one knew who she was until the images surfaced. When the police tracked the truck back to Floyd, they discovered that Cheryl's injuries matched those in the graphic photos. Floyd was found guilty of killing Cheryl Ann in 2001 based on this evidence, and he was given the death penalty. As of 2022, Floyd is still detained on death row. Additionally, pictures of Sharon being abused as a child as early as four years old and as a teenager were present in the envelope. Authorities surmise that Sharon attempted to flee from Floyd and left with Kevin Brown, a college student, which is why Floyd killed her. Floyd never admitted to killing Sharon, and he is not facing any charges in connection with her passing. Issei Sagawa had been dreaming of killing, dismembering, and devouring Rene Hardevelt for 32 years, until he did so in 1981. Born in Kobe, Japan, Sagawa was pursuing his studies in comparative literature in Paris at the time of his offense. He was taken into custody and committed to a mental health facility nearly straight away. But thanks to a legal loophole, 
he was allowed to check himself out of a different mental institution after his extradition to Japan, and he is still at large today. He has essentially built a life off his crime in the years since, and he has even gained a certain amount of fame in Japan, along with authoring manga novels that gruesomely illustrate Hartvelt being killed and eaten, he has made multiple talk show appearances. He has even remained chillingly unrepentant throughout his life, having appeared in softcore videos reenactments in which he bites actors. He talks about his crime as if it were the most normal thing in the world, and he even intends to commit it once more. Issei Sagawa was born on April 26, 1949, and he has been obsessed with eating human flesh and harboring cannibalistic impulses for as long as he can remember. With nostalgia, he recalled how his uncle used to disguise himself as a monster, putting him and his brother inside a stew pot to be eaten. He was drawn to fairy tales about people being eaten, and Hansel and Gretel was one of his favorites. He even recalls thinking, Yum, that looks delicious, when he glimpsed classmates' thighs in the first grade. He equates his cannibalistic dreams with what most people would consider sexual desire and blames the media for promoting images of Western ladies such as Grace Kelly. Sagawa's desire was not to bed these gorgeous women like other people did, but to devour them. Issei Sagawa claims that no one who doesn't experience his identical cravings can comprehend or explain the reasoning for his cannibalistic impulses. That's nothing more than a fetish he claimed. For instance, a typical male who had a desire for a girl would naturally want to see her, be close to her, smell her, and kiss her. Correct? Eating seems to me to be only a continuation of that. To be honest, I find it incomprehensible that not everyone experiences the same desire for eating others. But he insists that he only ever considered gnawing on their flesh and never considered killing them. He had pencil-thin legs and was always short and slender. As he stated in his best-selling book, In the Fog, he thought that his height of little under five feet made him too ugly to draw the kind of closeness that might have restrained his cravings. Despite Sagawa's attempt to consult a doctor at the age of 15 for his cravings, it was of no use to him, so he withdrew even more into his seclusion. Finally, in 1981, after 32 years of suppressing his desires, he took action. Issei Sagawa relocated to Paris in order to pursue a degree in literature at the public research university Sorbonne. He claimed that once there, his cannibalistic impulses took over. He wrote in the fog, Almost every night I would bring a prostitute home and then try to shoot them from behind. It was no longer so much a desire to devour them as it was a fixation with the notion that I had to kill a female for the sake of this devotion, no matter what. He eventually selected the ideal victim. René Hartfelt was a Dutch student at the Sorbonne who studied alongside Sagawa. Sagawa became friendly with her over time and would sometimes invite her to supper at his house. Eventually, he won her trust. Before actually killing her, he made a single failed attempt. When she turned her back, the gun misfired the first time. Even while most people would see this as a call to give up, Sagawa was only led deeper and further down his rabbit hole by it. He continued, It made me even more insane, and I knew that I had to kill her. And he did the very following night. This time, the gun fired, instantly killing Hartfelt. Sagawa merely felt sorrow for a split second before becoming elated. He remembered that he had considered calling for an ambulance, but then decided not to be ridiculous. It's finally happening. You've been fantasizing about this for 32 years. He killed her, raped her corpse, and started chopping her open right away. My first action was to sever her buttock. Regardless of the depth of my cuts, all I could see was the fat beneath the skin. It looked like corn, and it took a while to actually reach the red meat, Sagawa recalled. I immediately tore off a slice of flesh with my fingers and shoved it into my mouth as soon as I saw it. For me, it was genuinely a historic occasion. In the end, he remarked that the only thing he regretted 
was not having eaten her when she was still alive. He remarked, I really wanted to eat her living flesh. I didn't mean to murder her. My ultimate goal was to eat her. But no one seems to believe me. Sagawa disposed of what was left of Hartvelt's remains two days after she killed her. After consuming as well as freezing the majority of her pelvic region, he packed her head, body, and limbs into two suitcases and called a cab. He was left off at Bois de Boulogne Park, which contained a private lake, by the cab. He was going to dump the luggage in it, but a few witnesses saw that the suitcases was leaking blood, so they called the French police. Sagawa made a straightforward admission when the police located him and asked him questions. He answered, I killed her so I could devour her flesh. In a French prison, Isai Sagawa waited for his trial for two years. When the time came for his trial, French judge Jean-Louis Bruguier dropped the accusations against him, ruled that he was legally ill, and ordered that he be kept in a mental facility indefinitely. After that, they deported him back to Japan, where he was meant to die in a mental health facility, but he never went there since the charges had been dropped in France. The court records were kept confidential and could not be given to the Japanese government. As a result, the Japanese had no legal basis to prosecute Issei Sagawa and were forced to release him. Furthermore, Issei Sagawa checked himself out of the Tokyo Mental Health Facility Matsuzawa on August 12, 1986. Since then, he's been free. Issei Sagawa is unrestricted to do as he pleases when he strolls around his home city of Tokyo today. A horrifying realization that the thought of spending the rest of one's life behind bars hasn't managed to control one's desires. According to him, the urge to devour peaks in June when women start wearing less clothes and expose more skin. Just now, on my way to the train station, I noticed a female who had pretty lovely buttocks. I get the urge to devour someone before I die when I see things like that. I'm trying to imply that I can't bear to think of dying and never getting to taste her thighs or those buttocks I saw this morning. He went on, I want to eat them again while I'm still here, so that when I pass away at least I will be contented. He's even got his strategy all worked out. Sukiyaki or Shabu Shabu, both lightly boiled small slices, are my picks for the finest method to truly enjoy the meat's inherent flavor. Sagawa has abstained from cannibalism in the interim, but it hasn't stopped him from making money off of his crime. He wrote restaurant reviews for the Japanese magazine Spa and was a hit on the lecture circuit where he talked about his urges and crime. He has also authored 20 books thus far. His most recent book, Extremely Intimate Fantasies of Beautiful Girls, is chock full of illustrations, both by well-known painters and himself. He expressed his hope that those who read it would at least cease viewing him as a monster. Sagawa reportedly had two heart attacks in 2015 and is a suffering from diabetes. Now 72, he resides in Tokyo with his brother and still attracts media interest. French filmmakers captured the two conversing in 2018. As your brother, would you eat me? Sagawa's brother asked him. Sagawa solely responded with a silence and a blank face. Murder and mystery followed what had begun as a romantic college relationship. In 1994, while both students at California Polytechnic State University were enrolled in college, Scott Peterson and Lacey Rocha crossed paths. Two years later, they got married. In 2002, Lassie became pregnant. They intend to raise their unborn son, Connor, in Modesto, California, where they currently reside. According to Scott Peterson, he left his pregnant wife alone on Christmas Eve morning so he could go fishing at the Berkeley Marina, which is roughly 90 miles away. According to him, Lacey was going to sweep the kitchen floor and take the couple's puppy, Mackenzie, for a walk. Hours later, Scott claims to have arrived home to find Mackenzie by herself, still on a leash without any sign of Lacey. Lacey's stepfather reported her missing to the police that evening. A massive search for Lacey Peterson was started by volunteers, family, and friends. On Christmas Day morning, Scott Peterson was questioned by police. According to John Bueller, 
a retired Modesto police investigator. Scott didn't appear to be particularly curious. We frequently get a ton of queries from a victim who was left behind. And from him, we heard none of it. A suspicious lead prompted Modesto detectives to investigate less than a week after Lassie Peterson's disappearance. Amber Frey, a massage therapist from Fresno, disclosed that she had been seeing Scott Peterson for more than a month. She reported to the police that Peterson had misled her by claiming to be not married. Her recall, as noted by former investigator Bueller, was phenomenal. It resembled a screenplay from a classic television series or something similar. In an attempt to find any hints that could point them in the direction of the missing woman, Amber Frey recollected every aspect of their romantic dates, right down to their outfits. Frey even complied with the detective's request to record her conversations with Scott Peterson on phone. Amber Frey makes her affair with Scott Peterson public during a dramatic news conference held one month after Lacey Peterson disappears. She remarked, I pray for Lacey's safe return, and I am very sorry for the pain this has caused her family. Before Frey made this announcement, Peterson had informed her over the phone that he was in Paris, while he was actually in Modesto, when Lassie was still being searched for. Scott eventually told her, I've been lying to you about my traveling. Later on, the taped conversations would be included in a devastating prosecution against Peterson. On the shoreline of San Francisco Bay, two bodies were discovered on April 13 and 14, 2003. Later on, they are revealed to be Lacey Peterson and her unborn kid. The two corpses were found roughly one mile apart. On April 18, Scott Peterson was apprehended by the authorities at a San Diego golf course. Inside the car, authorities discovered several cell phones, his brother's ID card, and a wad of cash. A few days subsequently, Peterson entered a not guilty plea to two charges of capital killing. June 2004 marks the start of Scott Peterson's trial in San Mateo County, California. The trial was shifted from Modesto to Redwood City in San Mateo County due to widespread media coverage. The judge reached to this decision because she believed it would be difficult for Peterson to have a fair trial in such a close-knit community where feelings were running high. Amber Frey spoke to the jury for the first time about her connection with Scott Peterson during what many saw as a significant turning point in the trial. A man who was secretly married and all the lies he told her. His credibility was damaged by Frey's portrayal of him as a dishonest man who could fluently tell falsehoods. The taped phone calls that Frey gave allowed the jurors to hear the lies for themselves. For the deaths of his wife Lacey and his unborn son Connor, Scott Peterson was found guilty of first-degree murder and second-degree murder, respectively. Four months after his conviction, in March 2005, Scott Peterson received a death sentence. During a news conference, Rochelle Nice, the seventh juror, referred to the prison where Peterson would serve his term as your new home and labeled him a jerk. Because of the hue of her hair, Nice earned the moniker Strawberry Shortcake during the trial. Following two appeals, the California Supreme Court reversed Scott Peterson's death sentence in August 2020, ruling that the trial judge had erred in selecting the jury for the case. Supporters of Peterson claim that as a result of that mistake, the jury was biased in favor of the death penalty. Peterson, pictured above in 2018, will now have a second trial that will just include the sentencing phase. The California Supreme Court directs a subordinate court to reconsider Peterson's murder convictions and determine if a whole new trial is warranted. Supporters of Scott Peterson claim that it all boils down to Rochelle Nice, the juror who was referred to as Strawberry Shortcake and who is photographed here in 2005, doing what she did during jury selection. Upon completing a questionnaire, potential jurors were asked whether they had ever been involved in a litigation or experienced any criminal activity. Nice verified, no. It's very obvious that she told us lies about her personal circumstances right in front of us. According to Pat Harris, Peterson's current lawyer, Nice has really been involved in two domestic conflicts in the past. 
Prosecutors, however, contend that Nice did not mislead when she answered the questions. She simply didn't consider herself as a victim and didn't think her prior experiences pertained to the questions. A lower court will now decide whether to grant Peterson a full retrial. Janny Peterson, the sister-in-law of Scott Peterson, was interviewed by CBS News Jonathan Vigliotti in her war room of evidence in March 2021. She says that she can prove he is not guilty. She alleges that after Scott claimed to have left for the fishing trip, witnesses spotted Lacey strolling around the area, close to the Peterson residence. Scott was not able to kill Lacey if that is indeed the case. According to Scott Peterson's lawyer, there has been a lot of backlash because some witnesses who saw Lacey that day were not called. At the time, it was believed that some of the witnesses were either contradicting or had poor recollections of what they saw. According to retired detective John Bueller, nobody saw Lacey alive that morning. He claims that there were other pregnant young women in the neighborhood that resembled Lacey. Furthermore, it would be rather simple for someone to misidentify one of those three girls as Lacey. Janie Peterson is adamant that Scott is innocent despite this. Perhaps more significant to a fresh defense argument is Janie Peterson's interpretation of Lacey's true events. She indicates an apparent break-in across the street from the Peterson residence, which she suspects occurred the same day Lacey vanished. Supporters of Scott Peterson speculate that when Lacey confronted the intruders, things went wrong. But the burglars, Stephen Todd and Donald Pierce, seen in this 2003 Modesto Authorities Department press release, were apprehended by authorities right away. During a status hearing on a new capital trial, Scott Peterson appeared in court by video conference. Scott Peterson is resentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole in December 2021. According to Peterson and his backers, a wrongfully accused man is behind bars for the killings of Connor and Lassie. Well, I guess it's possible, but you know, there are still people that believe the earth is flat too. Detective Bueller responded to that. Lisa Theris came out of the woods in Alabama on August 12th. She was discovered walking down Highway 82, close to Union Springs, naked, sunburned, and bruised by a passing motorist after she had been lost for 28 days in the wilderness. Since then, a thorough inquiry has been conducted into the strange incident that she is said to have only survived by consuming wild mushrooms and berries and drinking muddy water. Authorities have now disclosed their theory for why they think Theris vanished in the first place, as well as how she was able to stay put for such a long time. She was under the influence of methamphetamine. According to police investigating the case, the abuse of meth caused the 25-year-old Theris to become disoriented and experience hallucinations. Given that Theris was supposedly never more than a mile from the closest road, this could very well explain why she was never able to find her way out of the woods. She was most likely to be intoxicated. According to Bullock County Sheriff Raymond Rogers, she was lost in the woods and going through paranoia, as reported by the Daily Mail. She most likely took off her clothes since she was so high on drugs. Unaware of her surroundings, she found herself in an unfamiliar environment. Theris is accused of using the drugs with two local men, 36 years old, Randy Oswald, and 31 years old, Manly Davis, who are both well known to the police due to their prior drug related and petty criminal offenses. Then, on July 19th, right after Theris had her final conversation with her parents before going missing, Oswald and Davis are said to have taken Theris with them when they sneaked into a nearby hunting lodge. But according to reports, Theris leaped out of the truck and into the woods as the men were getting ready to smash through the metal entrance gate of the lodge. Since then, the two men have been detained for the break-in and linked to the disappearance of Theris. In fact, they have even accused one another of killing Theris in the days preceding her discovery. Authorities were initially informed by Oswald that Davis had shot the girl in the head, put her body in a garbage bag, and thrown it into Creek. Of course, though, the police clearly found no body. 
They were so engrossed that they began accusing each other for a murder that had never occurred. While Oswald and Davis were flinging allegations at each other, Theris was all by herself in the woods. Theris very well would not have survived the extreme perils she encountered. The coyotes, poisonous snakes and spiders, a shortage of food and water, and constant, sweltering heat. She did, however, survive the detour, even though she was sunburned and had scratches, insect bites, and poison ivy welts on her skin. Not to mention that she has, indeed, lost between 40 to 45 pounds since going in. Given that Theris has now returned to the public eye and the case surrounding her absence has been resolved, authorities are focusing on her involvement in the incidents that transpired just before her disappearance. Theris might have done more than just use meth. She might have taken part in the burglary of the hunting lodge, stayed in the woods on purpose to elude authorities and other possible offenses. Randy's father, George Oswald, as well as the manager of the Broken Inn Lodge, expressed his intense anger towards his son, saying, He has embarrassed my name. He's stolen from my good friends, and he's got a lot of questions to answer. But if she's a sweet little princess, who got lost in the woods for all this time, then I'm the Pope. It's simply not possible. Roger, for his part, says that he hasn't completely ruled out accusing Theris of the break-in that is currently keeping Oswald and Davis in custody. Theris's conclusion to join Oswald and Davis now rests on the results of an increasingly bizarre story being investigated. If you find this video compelling, show your support by giving it a thumbs up, subscribing to our channel, and ringing that notification bell. By doing so, you'll stay updated about the latest investigations and mysteries. Your support means the world to us as we continue to pursue the truth in the world of unsolved cases.